Amelia, welcome to the 40 Minute Mentor. How are you? I am amazing. Thank you so much for having oh, me. Oh, such a pleasure. And we have had the pleasure of working together, or I have had the pleasure of working with you. Um, so this is extra special, um, and we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff that I know our audience are going to really enjoy. So before we jump into clout and your career, can we start with some quick fire questions? Is that all right? Yes. <laughs> amazing. Right. If you could finish the following sentences, that would be great. When I was younger, I always wanted to be... Oh God, when I was younger, I always wanted to be a fashion designer. That was my dream. Interesting, interesting, okay. And actually it's interesting because I am not a fashion girl at all now. Like I couldn't care less about fashion trends anymore. <laughs> so I don't know where that came from. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, my first job was? My first job was working in a tanning salon in Chiswick, West London. And I was fired from it um, within six months of getting that job because I used to take tanning beds when I was meant to be working. Love that. So, <laughs> and they uh, they found that on CCTV and obviously didn't think it was that appropriate. No. So yeah, I got let go oh, that job pretty that's fast. That's hilarious. Um, my biggest... I was only I was going to say, I was going to say, you're allowed, you know, we're all allowed one of those. Um, I, I, on my first day of working in a hotel when I was at Uni in Leeds, I went through the fire exit uh, that was alarmed and I woke everyone up. So uh, I did not last much longer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my biggest achievement in my career to date is? Biggest achievement in my career to date, I think was having the balls to leave the business I was working for and start my own. Um, I had, and this is quick fire, but for like context, I had a business when I was 21 and it was pretty successful in the first 12 months, but failed in the second year. And I was really burnt by that experience for a long time. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to do something and be my own boss and all that kind of stuff, but nothing ever really felt like right. And I didn't really have the confidence in myself or the belief in myself that I could do it again because it had failed mm. the first time. So the, my proudest moment is actually being like, no, you can do this. No plan B no backup plan like that's just try it and see what happens love that so, yeah that's my love that moment, and yeah well, well done for for going again it is it's a really daunting thing but um it's it's certainly paying off which we'll talk about in a bit um i wish i could be better at i wish i could be better at being organized <laughs> worst like i so one of the things that we ask our team during the one, to, one monthly one-to-ones we have is like what do i suck at and what am i great at um or, or the things that always come up with great is like you're a great hype person like i'm always the one like shouting at my team and being like you've done this so well like whatever i'm i'm give everyone a pep talk every now and again um but the thing that always comes up consistently that i suck at is organization like i'm always late um you know things are never done on time and that's because i'm juggling so many balls and also because i'm a creative mm. chaotic nice nightmare <laughs> So I wish I was better at that. Ironically, you were you were early for the podcast, so <laughs> maybe that is a trait that you're you're this working on. This is like the on. first yeah. thing I've ever been early. I bet, for. I bet the team are going to be like, "What? She was early? What is this?" Um, but I was I was I was honoured. I was very honoured. Um, great. Well, I think the next one is a good one. My biggest vice is tequila. Oh, that's so easy for me. I spend so much money on tequila. Really? It's, oh, and also fossils. I don't know if you can see in the background. I have like a fossil collection. So I've got a big ammonite there. I've got a little ammonite there. And then just above, I have a megalodon tooth, which is 3 million years old. Whoa. So that those are tequila and fossils. Are my what vices. a niche combo. Very niche. What a niche combo. I mean, I can't, I am partial to yeah. uh, uh, the odd tequila shot, but uh, yeah, that's, and my daughter loves collecting fossils. This is a new thing. So there we go. Perfect. Um, Honestly, and I used to do the same actually. I actually, I realised like back in the day, there were some, there's a whole bunch of fossils somewhere in my parents' home that I collected over the years and sort of used to sneak into school. So yeah, there we go. Something, uh, something we share. Um, and finally, can you share something we wouldn't learn from your CV? So that could be a failure or a setback that you've learned a lot from. What that we wouldn't learn from your CV? I was actually, I was interviewing Ash Jones yesterday, who's the great, who's the founder of Great Influence on my podcast Amazing. yesterday for, for what's coming out. And we had this kind of conversation similar to this about, you know, what is something that you wouldn't know that was like a huge life changing moment for you. And the thing that I said was for me was when a very well known, a very well respected um, industry figurehead told me that my idea for clout was going to crash and burn. And it was the worst business idea that I could ever possibly have. 
and that I should go and do quote marketing or something. Like he actually said marketing or something. He also actually said crash and burn. And I could have taken that moment and been like, oh my God, this is like the worst decision I'm making. Like I've just left my job for this. Like what am I doing? But instead I was like, no, fuck you. <laughs> like I'm gonna go and prove you wrong. And although his intention there was to really knock me off my confidence pedestal and to kind of put this little woman back in her place, what he actually did was ignited such a chip on my shoulder, which was the rocket fuel I needed to, to get clout to where it is. So yeah, that's not on my CV, but like I attest a lot of where I've got to in this business based on that one moment where that person said I couldn't. And I was like, actually I can. What a great I story. It, so. I, I, I love that. And I think, I mean, what an idiot, firstly. <laughs> but but secondly, I, I completely I completely get it. And, and actually, when I set JBM up, most people said, you're 25, you've only been doing this for two years. You, you just, what are you doing? Like, everyone in recruitment has like 10 more years experience. You're never going to be able to win any business. You're not very good at business development. And I was the same as you. I was like, okay, I like a challenge. Let's bring it on. And I'm going to, like, I'm going to prove you wrong. So it's, it's sometimes just what you need, isn't it? I feel like that, that like quote needs to be on your book uh, down the line or like or on, the, or on the wall somewhere just to like really rub it in his face when you're, uh, you're winning multiple awards. But yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's a great one. Thank you, Amelia. Well, um, we're going to talk a lot about cloud today. Um, but, but you've touched upon the earlier part of your career and I'd love to just get a bit of a snapshot of the younger Amelia, like what your early aspirations were. Um, obviously we talked a bit about fashion, but yeah, do you mind telling us a bit about that earlier part of your career and that first business you had? Because it sounded like it was going great guns and then, um, you know, not so much thereafter. So yeah, fill us in a bit more about that. Yeah, so I guess I had a pretty normal start to my career. Like I went to university, I did um, PR and applied communications, which to be honest, I didn't really want to do. I didn't I didn't want to go to university. I didn't enjoy university. I didn't think it was the the right path for me, but I didn't want to disappoint my parents. Um, and they were des like, you know, parents being parents just want the best for you. And sometimes what they think is best for you is not necessarily what is True. the right thing for you. It's just kind of like the beaten path. And I've never been someone who walks the beaten path. Like the path that I'm on is like a rocky, dusty mess. <laughs> And I'm quite happy to do that. And I've always been that way. Like I was never a popular kid at school. I had very niche interests. Like the music I liked was different. The clothes I wore were different. I was never the same as anyone else. And so I didn't feel like it was the right thing for me to do, but I did it anyway, because I didn't want to upset anyone. And when I came out of university, I'd, you know, I barely went to any lectures because I hated it so much. Um, I had like little side hustles here and there. Cause you know, I, I thought if I'm going to be at university, I may as well use the time to, to make a bit of money. Um, I, uh, I went and did a lot of internships with, with PR companies and PR departments and got to the end of my degree and thought, I don't want to do PR. Like I have to sell my soul to the devil to do this job properly. I'm going to get paid 21 grand a year. I'm going to have to be on 24 seven. Why on earth would anyone want to do that? And so I left university with really no idea of what was going to happen next but i knew i had to get a job i was an adult i had you know bills and a flat to pay for and i had to you know get my shit together so i went and worked for a sales uh, event sales company basically doing event big corporate events for like natwest and hsbc and that kind of stuff and it was in that job that i think i realized like how good i was at sales yeah and like actually like although there's lots of things that i don't know about life and about business and about whatever i'm really good at selling like i'm really good at getting people on side on the thing that I think that they should be doing. So I did a year of stint there and then thought, you know, as a 21 year old, arrogant little thing, I don't need you. I can go do this by myself. Um, so I quit that job and set up a fashion business. It was a, a B2, you know, a manufacturer basically. Okay. We were a brand um, and we sold into a bunch of different boutiques online. We were stocked internationally in 12 bricks and mortar boutiques. Oh. ASOS were about to sign us um, to be on their website. Like we, we were in the Daily Mail every week. Like we had, you know, we were doing really, really well. Um, and again, that arrogance thing came into play. I've got this cracked, you know, six months in and we're already doing all this revenue. This is easy. And unfortunately, when you start thinking this is easy and you've got it cracked, it's the exact moment where everything falls apart. And so what I thought was gonna be the rest, and it gives me goosebumps mm. talking about it. Cause I just remember when that business failed, just thinking my life is over. Yeah. Like I am, I'm never, I'm, I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. Like 
all those things that everyone feels when they're, you know, rejected by someone they love or, you know, when they get fired from a job that they love or just any that, that kind of, that in your pit, yeah. what am I going to do next? Yeah. Um, and at the same time, my relationship then fell apart and I lost my house, I lost my car, like everything I had was tied up in this business. I had to move back with my parents, with my little dog oh, no. and... I just thought I'd gone from being this sort of high flying 21 year old who was doing quite well for herself and, you know, driving a nice car and like all this kind of stuff. And all my friends thought was like the bell of the ball to being this, you know, the opposite of that, like asking my parents for money because I literally had like 23 P in my account and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And at the time I thought I can't come back from this, you know, who's going to hire me? Who's going to hire a 22 year old or 23 year old at that time that's failed and blah, blah, blah. And so I jumped on Google and typed in, jobs that you can make the maximum amount of money in that require no degree qualifications or no experience and it came up with recruitment <laughs> so i was like great recruitment Love it is it. <laughs> um and i started applying for recruit recruiter jobs and landed a job um at a SaaS agency and like that's where my story started really with personal branding is i figured really quickly that recruiters don't or rather candidates and clients don't buy from a recruiter because you work for JBM or you work for, you know, Oscar technology or three, you know, S3 or whatever, they buy from a recruiter because they love that recruiter mm. and that, that recruiter feels like they really resonate with them and they really have a good connection, a good relationship with them. And so I was like, well, why are we having these one-to-one conversations with people? We could just do this at scale. And that was kind of the journey that I then went on. And that's what ended up Incredible. with Incredible. I just wanted to pick up on something you said, y- you, you put the failure of your business down in part to being, you know, young, bit arrogant, probably taking your your sort of eye off the ball. But were there specific things or particular challenges in that first business that that ultimately were the undoing? Just I'm thinking for people listening that might be in a similar situation right now, who might need to hear this, um, it would be good just to to, to kind of explore that a bit further. One hundred percent. I I think the biggest failure in that business was think was the thinking that I knew everything and actually I knew nothing. Okay. Um, I thought, you know, I've got these suppliers, they're going to be great. You know, these boutiques will always be buying from us. You know, I, ne- I never thought that there would be an issue ever because we, we, it was working, mm. right? So why wouldn't it not work in the future? And actually the whole undoing of the business was our business model, which I had built with no experience. Okay. So although I'm definitely someone that talks about, you know, you don't need to have experience to achieve anything. You don't, you can learn on the job, but you also have to have the humility and the self-awareness to understand that you don't know a lot of stuff. Um, and I didn't have that because I was 21 and, you know, businesses were throwing money at me to stock my brand in their, in their, in their clothing store. And, you know, celebrities were asking to wear our clothes. Mm. And so I was like, well, this is, I've made it. Like I've got a fashion brand now. Um, and actually the undoing of the entire business was, our, as I said, our business model in that, I don't know if anyone listening understands how sort of fashion retail works, but how it works is we used to bring out capsule collections. There was 12 a year and we would sell those capsule collections into uh, boutiques, ASOS, etc., cetera. And um, they would pay 30% on order. So when they place the order with us, which is typically six weeks prior to delivery, so they'd pe- place an order, they put a deposit down for their order, right? So their order could be 150,000 pounds worth of stuff, but they would only need to put a 30% right. deposit down on that thing. And then they pay the rest on delivery. Now, unfortunately for us, we had one of our biggest clients put a 30% deposit down on a winter collection, which was all leather, leather pants, leather jackets, leather, you know, skirts, fur coats, like things that are very expensive to produce. They put a very big order down for it with us. And within six weeks, they'd gone bust. And so we were left with nearly a hundred thousand pounds worth of retail stock that we couldn't shift because we didn't have that kind of capacity through our website, right? Um, So it was either, try and shift this stock to other clients mm. who didn't need them because they'd already done their order. Yeah. They, they did had all the stuff they needed. Our agent was working her butt off trying to get them into new boutiques. But again, boutiques had already got mm. their stuff. They didn't, they didn't need any more um, products. And so we were left with this kind of cash flow problem in that we couldn't then design the next collection because we needed to pay the designers to do it. And all our cash flow was tied up in stock that we couldn't shift because we didn't get that oh. kind of volume to our website. And so it was like, Either we take out a huge loan against me and my value, and I didn't have any assets back mm. then. I had like a house, I had like a car that was worth like ten grand, um, and you know it was like take a take a huge loan out against various different things that I was scrambling around for, 
or shut the business down, liquidate everything and just cut our losses. What, what and at that time I'd split from my then boyfriend. Yeah, it was tough. Um, I, and bearing in mind, I'm 22, this 23 at mm. this, this time. So I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm a kid. Um, and I would, had just split with my partner who then became my husband, who's now my ex-husband. Uh, <laughs> I should have listened to the first <laughs> time around. But we, we split. And so I was facing, you know, heartbreak, house gone, business gone, everything gone. And I just thought, you know what? I can't do this by mm. myself. I can't, I can't scrap around to make this yeah. work. Um, and as I said, like, I think, yes, I can attribute a lot of, or well, almost all of the failure of that business to that one incident happening. Had I actually been humble enough to ask for help and had the humility and a self-awareness to not think I knew everything, I don't think that would have happened. But I am so glad it did, yeah. James, yeah. because if it hadn't have happened, if that business hadn't been a failure, then clout wouldn't be a success. And I believe that in my heart. Totally. And, and the point around humility and knowing when to ask for help is, is this is such a common problem, isn't it? When you're young and have early success, and I've seen it so many times with founders, um, and actually that, and I've done it myself, you know, being very headstrong in the early parts of my career, seen it as a weakness to sort of admit that I'm making mistakes or getting, and, and not, or, and just being embarrassed if that's the case by like the idea of telling someone that. But it, it, it can be the real difference between making and breaking a business, can't it? And, and what I love the fact that, you, you know, that difficult experience has then come back around and now you're that much better as an entrepreneur, as a founder, now that you've started to clout and it's clearly going very well. So, so what was the point that you decided to go for it again? And how did you get over that, that thing in the back of your head that was like, oh, I've done this before, it didn't work? I think with my first business, that wasn't organic at all. I just liked clothes and I didn't want to work for anyone else. So I thought, well, I'll just marry the two together and, and that's the business that I'm going to create. The difference with clout is clout was so organic, James. Mm. Like it, it, I was, as I said, I was working as a recruiter and then as a, a B2B marketing manager in a recruitment agency. And I was posting content online and, and trying to market myself as an individual because I knew that would have an impact on the business. And I was getting people DMing me and saying, hey, Amelia, you've got 8,000 followers. I've been following you since you had 1,500 only six months ago. Like, how did you do that? And me being as like lazy, because I am inherently lazy, um, I was like, well, why am I gonna reply to all these DMs individually when I can just start posting content about it? Because I was getting a lot of messages of them saying, saying the same thing. And so I started posting content about personal branding and like how I built a following on LinkedIn. And all of a sudden my followers went from like 8,000 to like 23,000. Wow. Like, so fast and I was like well there's an appetite for people wanting to know this and I'm a few steps ahead so hopefully I can help a couple of people I never started posting content for the point of monetizing it I was just sharing because that's what wanted people wanted to know like I, I just wanted to help people basically um and then it got to a point where my then employer started making money off my personal branding expertise right mm. they were like running workshops and putting me in there to teach people how to do it but they were getting all the cash for it and I thought Hang on a second, like, how come I'm getting paid 50 grand a year or 40 grand a year and you're charging three grand a workshop? Yeah. Like, and I'm doing one of these a lot. I'm doing a lot of these for you. <laughs> Why don't I just do this for myself? Yeah. Like, I only need to do one a month and I'm already earning the same as you're paying yeah, me. So, uh... you know, I may as well do this myself. And this was also coinciding with the lockdown, right? So everyone in lockdown, I think, anywhere I've spoken to had this sort of moment of self-reflection because there was never really a time in anyone's life where you had to force to sit at home and reevaluate your life and what made you happy mm. and what you wanted your life to look like. And in that sort of self-actualization was, I really fucking hate working for this company. <laughs> Not because I don't like the company, I love the company. The, you know, I'm still really good friends with the guys that founded it and you know, I, I see them often, but I didn't want to work for mm. anyone. And that was kind of the first realization piece. And then the second realization piece was like, I don't enjoy the work I'm doing, but I really love this content mm. bit. I really love helping people and, trying to get them to build their personal brands because I know how beneficial yeah. it's been to me. And to, for context, I was headhunted into that role because of my personal brand. So I was like, if I can help someone get the dream, you know, their dream job because of their personal brand, it's gonna be great. And then I was like, how can I monetize this? And so it was all very, yeah. very organic. I didn't just wake up and go, personal branding, <laughs> business idea. It just kind of happened. Um, and it's been the best decision, best decision I made. Like. Yeah, I, I mean, some days I'm sure you can relate and anyone listening to this who's a business owner can relate. Some days I'm like, this sucks yeah. and I hate my life, but <laughs> someone else. 
and all the things. But then you get that little twinkle of magic, that little viral post for a client or, you know, someone messages you and goes, we just won a 600 grand contract off the back of that post you did for us. Like that's yeah. like, oh, okay. Amazing. Amazing. And I think, yeah, I, it's so true. I think almost every day you might have a moment which is like, oh my God, why do I do this? But then at the same time, the highs are so high and you're your own <laughs> boss, you know? And it, and it really is, so it's, it is your baby and, it, and that's exactly how I feel. Um, well, we've, we've given our listeners a bit of a taster, but for anyone that hasn't heard of Clout, could you tell them a bit about what your mission is and like exactly kind of how that, that concept turned into the business it is today? Yeah, so Clout's a personal branding agency. So we look after um, CEOs, founders, entrepreneurs, social media, basically. It's kind of digital PR. We, we take the keys to their social media and try and blow them up as much as humanly possible on those platforms in a really authentic way. Um, so we tell stories, we talk about stuff they're passionate about, we try and have, you know, write strong opinions to them, everything comes from them. And the whole point of this is to put people, not about, it's not about attention, it's not about making someone famous, it's about putting someone in a position of thought leadership, because that's going to benefit their career, yes, but more importantly, their business, their employees, their opportunities, their revenue in many cases. Um, yeah, so we, we have the best job in the world, I think, because a lot of agencies work with brands and they're really fun to work with. But with an individual, you're telling someone's real story mm. and you're telling you're telling people about someone as opposed to something. And I just think that's just, it's just so cool. Like we sit and have chats with people like you, James, and we're just in awe of like what you've achieved. And like, we just feel so privileged that we get to tell these stories and, and kind of, yeah, just bring such a human element to marketing a business through people. So that's what we and do. and you guys are so good at it and a, and a real joy to to partner with and it's it's been very exciting to see the business grow you know from you know your bedroom in lockdown to now I think it's a team of twelve and growing and and um, what's that experience been like for you having you know we talked about that we won't dwell too much on the fact that you you know you had a bit of a failure early on in your career you're doing it again with all the learnings and 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 as you said that kind of organic growth story behind you what are the what are the lessons you've learned this time around and what are the what are maybe some of the challenges that you've had that you weren't expecting to face while scaling this sort of business because it's definitely a rocket ship yeah it what are some of the challenges i mean hiring is always a challenge and i think it's so funny i feel like that's such a cliche answer but it, it's so hard to hire people and it's not because there's not good people on the market mm. there are amazing people out there right it's that trying to pair those amazing people with our values and also get them bought in to this rocket ship, that trifecta is so, so difficult, true. right? Because I don't, I don't want anyone in my business, not because we're arrogant and we think we're better than anyone else, we don't. But I just think if you aren't 100% bought into where a business is going and you're working in a business like ours and yours, James, where it's chaotic and it's scrappy and things move at a million miles an hour, you will not survive. Yeah. Like, it, it, and we've seen it, we've, we've lost, you know, we've, we've had to let go of two people because they just, it wasn't, they weren't good people. It's just, they just couldn't mm. cope with the pace in which we work at. And so trying to hire people that fit into that way of working is like, not impossible, but almost impossible. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, so true. That's been the biggest challenge for me is, is finding those people. Um, the second thing has been management. Like I am not a good manager, James. I am a, I'm a good leader and I have the self-awareness and it's not an arrogant thing. I'm, I'm confident in my ability to lead. I, I think I'm good at bringing people together for a common cause and pushing people in the right direction and getting everyone hyped up to go on that journey with me. I'm terrible at the day-to-day -day management stuff. Like I, I have a really bad emotional intelligence. Like if someone cries, I'm sort of like pat them on the back kind of vibes. And like, I just don't really know how to handle it. Whereas some of the people that I've hired, Sarah, one of my employees who you know well, is amazing at that. Mm. And so the thing that's been, I suppose, the biggest challenge for me, but also the best lesson for me at the same time has been, you don't have to be good at everything. And actually the reason I'm building a business is because I'm not good yeah, at everything. Indeed. I, need to, I need to hire people who are better than me in specific things so that I can focus on doing what I'm really good at, which is driving this business forward and getting it to where I want it to be. And, doing stuff like this and getting as much exposure for the business as humanly possible and selling mm. and all those things I'm great at. And then people like Sarah can focus on the day-to-day -day management of people because she's so good at that. And Kirsty can focus on community management or even account management because she's really good mm. at that. 
and let people who are way more better at those jobs do those jobs. Like I'm the founder of a business, it's controversial. I have no aspirations to be CEO. Interesting. When we get to the point and we have a board and we need that C-level position, because at the moment we don't have titles, I'm just like founder. Like I have no, I, like, I have no ego about it. Like I don't need to have some big crown on my head. Like I, you know, it is what it is. But when we get to that point, I don't want to be CEO mm. because I know my skill set does not align with what that person needs to have as skills. I might, I'm a, I'll be a great CMO, mm. and maybe I'm just, I'm the co-owner or the owner at that point. But I don't want to be CEO, and that's because I don't have those skills. So, challenges, yes, hiring and management, but they've also been huge lessons in that you have to let go of your ego and make decisions on what's best for the business and not necessarily best for you so sense. true so true and and so much of what you said it, it resonates with me and i'm sure loads of our audience um you know obviously you know what we do we find people jobs and uh, are working with some of the fastest growing startups in the world and um hiring is the number one challenge for everybody and that doesn't change if you're a, an eight person business like ours or a 12 person business like yours that is still is if, if anything it's even more important right to get the right people in the in the right seats and timing is so important as well and yeah the management piece i, I think we've discussed this before i i love leading i love being the founder of jbm but I am very open about not being the best manager. I think I, I don't have the patience and there are definitely better people. But um, again, it's a work in progress. You know, you have to do things you're not so good at. And I think, like you said, when you get to that point where you can bring in experts or people that are better at you, better than you, it's not a failing. It's actually a really good thing for a leader to admit your, where your gaps are and then plug them. So I totally agree with that. Um, I wanted to talk, obviously, about personal branding, given what you do, and you're a real expert at it. And I think particularly because I was a skeptic, right? Um, you've really helped me see the power of it firsthand. Um, but for anyone that, that hasn't done it, Mr. LinkedIn, top yeah, voice. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, but I think there are going to be people, let's be honest, that are going to be listening to this that don't get it. Uh, that haven't done it, haven't worked on their personal brands. So why is it so important? Can you tell us some of the results you've had across your clients and, and like why should people listening to this work on their own? So I think why it's so important, look, I'm going to start by saying this and this is going to sound really counterproductive for someone that runs a personal branding agency, but personal branding is not for everyone because to build a strong personal brand, you have to stand for something and you have to be willing to kind of put that out there in the world and be 100% okay with the consequences of having that opinion. Um, and that's not for everyone because some people won't even do that in their circle, right? They won't even do that with their friends and their family. So asking people to, those people to do that online is an automatic fail because they are they are not gonna be able to do it. Not because they're not you know better or worse than me or any of us, just simply because it's not in their mm. DNA to be that person. So that's, that's I wanna kind of caveat well, everything I'm about to say with that. Why it's so important though, is an individual has 10X the reach of a company brand online. Um, brand messages are shared 24 times more by individual employees than by companies. Um, leads that are brought in by um, individuals are significantly more likely to convert than if they come in through a company brand. And that is because people buy from people. They've always bought from people, right? There's always been dinners done in America. You golf know, courses. Going having work <laughs> lunches. Yeah. Golf courses. This is how business has always been done. And personal branding just does that at scale. Mm. There is no ceiling to how many relationships you can form when you build your personal brand. There is a ceiling to how many meetings I can go to, how many phone conversations I can have, how many speaking gigs I can do. There is a ceiling to that, right? Because I only have 24 hours in a day and even the biggest stadium in the world only holds 190,000 people. My biggest post would have filled that stadium like 20 times. Wow. One post. So personal branding is super, super powerful. And yours is the same. I think your biggest was like nearly 2 million or something. And you put that into context, just one piece of content mm. seen by 2 million people. I challenge you to try and be let known by 2 million people even in a year's time, yeah. let alone on one single minute that you posted something. So that's why it's so powerful. Um, kind of the next step of all of this is if you're an employer and you're listening to this and going, yeah, that sounds really good and like all that kind of stuff. But what if people leave and, you know, mm. what if people say the wrong thing and all that kind of stuff, which is a huge blocker for 
a lot of companies that we work for or work with, I should say. Um, and my whole argument there is like, yeah, but what if they say nothing and you're just then an option? Mm -hmm. So like there is definitely a lot of work to be done in terms of educating people as to why personal branding is so powerful and why they should be encouraging their team to do it. Because not only is it good for their team's career, but it's also good for the company, like revenue wise, employer branding wise, top of funnel brand awareness wise, opportunity wise. You know, we've worked with some really big businesses like Skybet, Paddy Power, Flutter Group, Cummins Inc. on employer branding because they know that people want to hear from leaders. Mm. Um, and so kind of getting that education piece in and, and working with clients like you is just so awesome because, you know, you get it. You understand why this is so important. And particularly in recruitment, I think there's a huge disparity between people wanting to stand out but being unwilling to stand yeah. out and I think that's something that you guys at JBM have really nailed so oh, thank you <laughs> yeah um I went off a bit, no. of a bit of a tangent there but some of the big some of the big wins I think definitely the clients have been monetary so we've had um one client did 600 grand in revenue off 30 days of content mm -hmm. with us um another one has done a quarter of a million in a year all inbound so 100% inbound you know into their dms whatever um, we've had other clients who've hired like for roles that they historically have been hiring for like six months for and couldn't hire anyone, then get placed into that role and be like the best candidate they've ever hired that came inbound as an application because of a piece of content that the CEO posted. Um, we had a, a really lovely story from a client recently who's in recruitment actually. And he said, Amelia, I just can't, I, I, you know, when we first started speaking, I know, you know, I was a bit skeptical, like you said, I was a bit skeptical about all this personal branding stuff, but you know, I posted a picture of our Christmas party at Christmas and you know what happened? And I said, what? And he said, we won the biggest deal of the year wow. off the back of that Christmas Incredible. party post. And I was like, hey, anyone would think that this uh, actually works. Well, there we go. So, and I think it's it's really important to hear. And this is one of the reasons I, I really wanted to get you on the podcast because I, I reckon there's a lot of people listening to this that have a lot to say, but they shy away from it. And it's gonna, it's a bit it's a bit like networking is seen as a dirty word. And I think personal branding ha possibly historically has. But I think companies like yours and, and people like yourself and, and and there are some amazing kind of thought leaders out there that are, I think, changing the game when it comes to this. And it really can be such a powerful thing. And um, I know from personal experience, it's hard to get started. Like That's kind of the difficult bit, isn't it? It's like actually going, I'm ready for this. I'm going to just start creating content. So what advice do you have for anyone listening that's like, I want to create some interesting content. I want to become that thought leader. And what are the do's and don'ts that they should kind of be aware of before they set out on that path? Okay, so let's start with the first part of your question. So how can someone do this? First and foremost, you need to be super clear on what you want to be known for. Um, and what I mean by that is, what do you stand for? Like, what's your, what, what are the things that you rant about in the pub with your mates? Like, what are the things that really get you riled up? What meetings would you walk out of if someone said something about that topic? Um, because building a... Per you could follow the blueprint that I've created and talk about the same topics that I'm talking about. And you probably have, have find some success because I have kind of gone that path and proved that talking about those things works, right? But you'll get to a certain point where your audience teeters off, your followers teeter off, and you kind of plateau because guess what? It's not authentic. Mm -hmm. It's not personal, right? You're just branding yourself. So you're then like every other other person on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. So the first thing you have to think about is what do you want to be known for? Like, what are the things that you really, not just, you know, want to tell people about, but like, what do you feel deep in your soul? It could be that, you know, your kid has ADHD and you feel like kid, kids with ADHD just get really badly treated at school because school doesn't look after them. Like that could be one of the things you want to be known mm. for, right? It doesn't have anything to do with your work, but you're really passionate about it. And the key to all of this is it's very, very difficult to have the confidence to start posting online, right? We all know that. I know that, you know that. Every, even Stephen Bartlett, oh by the way, when he first started posting content online, took him six hours to record a three minute video because he was stumbled over mm -hmm. his words, right? Wow. Everyone starts in the same place. But if you're talking about things you're confident in talking about because you feel so passionately about them, it becomes so much easier mm. because imagine being unconfident about posting content and then on top of that being unconfident about what you're talking about so find the things that you're confident in talking about it could be spurs <laughs> or like arsenal or like oh, hopefully yeah. not but find something <laughs> that is your thing yeah. right and then the second part of this is 
once you've sort of figured out what you want to be known for, which by the way, is a really difficult task yeah. to do. It's a very kind of confronting question. What do you want to be known for, right? There's a good exercise that um, you can do, which is where you write 20 words that you, that you feel about yourself. So it could be like kind, um, monochrome, like I am, I only ever wear black and white. Um, you know, it could be uh, luxurious, whatever you want it to be. And then you ask yourself 20 questions about those, those things, right? And that then helps you build a picture of who you mm. are and will help you answer the question of what you want to be known for. The next step to that is go and start commenting on people's stuff. I'm not going to sit here and force you to post content if you're not quite there yet. Just go and start commenting on people's mm. stuff. Go and start seeing what other people are posting, getting involved in discussions that other people have started. Yeah. Comments are content too, right? But they are a lot less scary to do because it's not on your feed. It's on someone True. else's. So particularly on LinkedIn, go and start commenting on people's stuff, build up your confidence, start adding value to other people's conversations. And what happens there is your confidence gets built because people are interested in what you have to say. And then you can go, okay, I've got this. I, I, I have the balls now to go and post my own piece of content. And even better, you could take a comment that got a lot of replies on someone else's post and then share that as content yourself. So it's kind of removed the barrier of entry there because you've already posted that thing. Mm. So you may as well share it on your page as well if it's done well on someone else's. Um, so first and foremost, get to figure out what you want to be known for. Second thing is start commenting. And then the third thing is once you have the confidence with commenting, rip that band-aid off and go for it. I think it's really, really easy for people to look at people, perhaps like you and I, who are obviously very active on social media and think it's easy for them. They're really confident. They know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? I didn't have any clue what I was doing when I started doing this. I just figured it out as I went along. And that's where everyone starts. Everyone starts at zero with everything, but most importantly, everyone starts with zero followers, zero engagement, zero posts. It's like going to the gym. You don't go, I'm gonna to go to the gym and get the sexiest body of my life. And then just don't go yeah. because you're scared or because you're the biggest person in the gym or because you're not as fit as everyone else. You go because you wanna you want to achieve mm, something, right? True. Personal branding's the same way. You start at zero, but you keep going, you keep chipping away. That one post got one like, amazing. That's one more like. That's a 100% increase on the post that you shared yesterday that got none. The next post you share gets 10. That's incredible. Look at the growth that you've already got after a week. It's all about paying into a high interest account, right? I always say to people, personal branding is not about the individual pieces of content mm. you share, which is why I could not care less whether my content gets 100 reactions or yeah. five reactions. It makes no difference to me. What matters to me is that the people I'm trying to talk to see my face and the stuff that I'm talking about every single day for a period of time until they decide they wanna be my follower mm. or be in my audience or ask me a question or whatever. And that is what personal branding is all about. It's not about the pennies that you pay into your, your high interest account. It's about the money that you make at the end of that period. I, I think just from hearing all that, I'm sure there's going to be, hopefully people listening to this that kind of get it and try it. Because look, as you said, it's not for everybody. But I think there's so many people out there that have great stories to tell and are passionate about things that will help the world and probably inspire others and, and sometimes you just need that little push so I, I'm hoping what you've just said will, will do that I think one of the things that you do so well media is you're you're not you, you never shy away from being open telling personal stories being vulnerable something that I've been working hard on which is something naturally that didn't always come to me um, but I, I really am, I'm trying to do that a lot more and I can see the power of that and how like it resonates with others what advice do you have for people listening to this it could be founders it could be just um you know employees that want to do a bit more online how, how do you get more comfortable with that and and how do you cope with the negative comments because you you know by putting yourself out there you are just going to get people that don't agree you're going to get keyboard warriors that are uh, mean how do you how do you reconcile with that and, and what advice do you have for others that put are put off because of that potential thing happening when i first kind of got intentional about personal branding. And by the way, I didn't even know it was called that when I first started, it was just posting stuff online. Um, when I first got intentional about it, I was really affected by what people said. Um, you know, someone goes, oh, you're an idiot, this is stupid. How dumb are you? No one cares. You know, all the usual keyboard mm -hmm. warrior stuff. And I'm not joking. I used to sit there sometimes and be like, what have I done wrong? Like, I saw someone else post this yesterday or the similar topic yesterday and they they all got loved for it. Like, what, what, what have I done? 
Um, and it is really, really easy just to take things personally mm. when people are sat behind a keyboard and, you know, want to give you their opinion because guess what? They can because they're sat behind a keyboard and they can't, they've got the balls to be able to give you that opinion. And in many ways, you want them to give you yeah. their opinion because that's what social media and engagement is all about, right? And it used to really affect me. And then I got to a point where I sort of had kind of a, a pet talk with myself and sort of reached out to some people in my mentors even. It's appropriate <laughs> to mention while we're on the 40-minute mentor podcast. Um, and said, look, like, how am I going to deal with this? Because this is only going to get yeah. worse, right? Particularly as I'm a woman. I'm not going to make this about gender, but, you know, a, a women get a pretty... Women who are opinionated online, I ch challenge you to go and have a look at thought leaders that are men versus thought leaders that are women and have a look at the comments and you come back to me and tell me mm. what you think. Um, we get a little bit of a raw deal because it's, it's, an un, it's an unusual thing for a woman to have such strong opinions online because, you know, historically we're sort of sat in a corner. Um, but I kind of had to sit down with myself and spoke to some people about it and the best bit of advice I got, and it was almost like a light bulb moment for me. And I don't know whether it was this person saying this to me or whether it was already going to happen anyway, but... They said, Amelia, why are you taking criticism for people that you wouldn't take advice from? Mm, so true. And I just thought, yeah, Amelia, why are you taking criticism from people you wouldn't take advice from? Do you give a shit what he thinks about your outfit or she thinks about your outfit? No. Yeah. Then why the hell do you give a shit about so what they true, think yeah. about your opinion? So they don't know you. They don't have context. They've just read a three-line post that you put on LinkedIn and decided you're a bit of an idiot. So what? Yeah. What's, what is going to happen? Like, you know, do you know what I mean? And that was a light bulb moment for me where I was like, yeah, I don't care what you think. And actually more, I've kind of elevated up from there now where I don't even care whether you like what I have to say. I'm completely indifferent. <laughs> and I'm in this now like weird sort of Nirvana state of social media Zen where I don't care at all mm. because I'm going to put out what I'm going to put out in a way that I think is going to serve the community that I want to build. And if you don't like that, that means that you're not you're not meant to be a part of that community. Yeah. And if you do like it, good. I'm glad it helped you, but you're not validating me. Yeah. I'm I already feel confident in who I am and the stuff that I feel strongly about. Social media is not a source of validation for your personality. It's just a distribution channel for it. And the minute that you can make that distinction, the minute everything becomes easier. You become more confident. You don't really give a crap about what people have to say about you. You are way more happy to have stronger opinions because you're like, hey, this is how I so feel. True. And some people might agree with, disagree with me and that's totally fine. I think the amazing thing about your personality and why personal branding is so good if you're a business owner is it attracts who you want it to attract and it repels who you want it to repel. And that's a superpower, not a bad thing because it means that you're not attracting people who are going to be negative or who aren't aligned with your values into your ecosystem, right? So that's, I think, the important thing. Um, and then how do you deal with the negative comments? We're kind of back to your question. Um, there's two, there's, there's kind of three types of negative comment you'll get. Or I've got anyway. The first one will be like, you're an idiot. Like basically like the stupidest comment ever, right? <laughs> it is, mate. Cheers, yeah. engagement. Doesn't affect me at all. This, yeah, thanks Dave from Leeds. <laughs> um, the, the second thing will be like, oh, I, you know, I hate your club. I hate your outfit. Like, why would you buy that top? Or like, why are you, why did you cut your, I had this recently because I used to have long, really long blonde hair, right? I had so many people DM me being like, why did you cut your hair? It looks really bad now. Oh, and I'm no. like, that, that could really affect me, right? Because it's about my physical appearance, okay? But my whole thing is like, I don't care whether you don't like my hair. I like my hair, right? Um, and actually, if I was walking down the street, you wouldn't come up to me and say you didn't like my right. hair. It's only because you're sat behind a screen and you don't have any consequences to your actions that you're saying this to me, right? So I ignore those because they're insignificant. They're not adding any value to the discussion at all. Um, and the third type of negative comment you'll get will be people who are just unbelievably obnoxious, rude, racist, homophobic, all those things. Those comments happen virtually never because now there's real life consequences to people mm -hmm. behaving that way online. Um, but I have had instances in the past where I have had maybe one or two of those types of comments. And in those instances, I've just reported yeah. them. In every other instance, I just say, thanks for your input and like put a thumbs up and <laughs> emoji. And actually that's also quite fun because it's really petty as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. The kind of passive aggressive, just like petty or something. But it's true, like that actually will rile those people yeah. up, but maybe they'll think twice about, you know, just wasting everyone's time by like stupid comments. Yeah, I I, I, I think I, I think that's super helpful, Milia. And, and actually, you know, I 
Oh, that was one of the things I was worried about, to be honest with you. And I think over time, you just, yeah, like you say, you, you realise as long as you're authentic, right, and you're creating content that is legitimate and something you care about, then it doesn't really matter. People are going to people are gonna disagree with you all throughout life in, in, in all different forums. Um, and I guess online content is, is no different. Um, and I think it's just getting comfortable with that, as you said. I just Before we get on to our wrap-up questions, Amelia, I just wanted to ask you about imposter syndrome specifically, because it it's kind of linked. Um, and a lot of people don't work on their personal branding because they don't feel perhaps they have anything to say um, or, or a, you know, a powerful enough story to share. So, and we probably all can relate to that, right? Uh, you know, at some point in our lives or, or, or kind of it's the, the niggle, the devil on the shoulder. So what's your take on that? And, and just as a kind of parting thought for anyone listening, what advice do you have for anyone that's really suffering from that imposter syndrome right now, but has something to say? I'm going to start off by saying I hate the term imposter syndrome because I think it implies that there's something wrong with you mm. because it uses the word syndrome. There is nothing wrong with doubting yourself. It's completely normal. Yeah. We all doubt ourselves every single day. Every single day I walk into the office and doubt myself. Every single day I'm like, am I gonna do a good job as a leader today? Am I gonna do a good job for my clients today? Oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Every single person, I, I'm gonna get found out. Yeah, Someone eventually so is gonna knock me off this rocket ship that I'm on because they're gonna realize that I don't actually know what I'm doing, even though I've been doing it for two years. I get that every single day. And the way I speak to myself now is, that's normal, Amelia. That's fine. You're okay. No one's gonna come and no one's gonna come for you. You're you're here because you earned it. You have these opinions like with your team, so why wouldn't you have them online? So first and foremost, I think it's about reframing this idea of imposter syndrome being a syndrome. It's not. You're just doubting yourself, which is actually something that's really good because it keeps you competitive. Mm. If you thought that you were the best thing since sliced bread, you would have never amount to anything because you would never learn anything, right? Having a bit of self-doubt is good because it means you're constantly trying to improve. You're constantly trying to get onto the next thing and grow and evolve. So reframing it in your mind of actually, this is keeping me competitive as opposed to holding me back is a really positive thing. And I think the second thing is from a practical perspective, and you're gonna listen to this and probably think I'm insane, but I talk to myself all the time, like out loud. I will literally have conversations with myself in the kitchen by myself. Like a really good example of this is I had a really bad day about two, or really bad week, should we say, about two weeks ago. I'm going through a lot of stuff in my personal life. My divorce is probably the hardest thing I've mm. ever gone through in my life. I'm juggling co-parenting. I'm you know, trying to grow this business. I had to fire two people in the space of seven days. And, ev and we had problems with clients and it just felt like everything was just, I felt like, I don't know if you remember that, that meme of that woman standing under the wave. Yeah. And I just felt like that woman standing under, under the wave, just waiting for that wave to crash on her and be drowned basically and I, I could have sat there and been like oh this is so hard i can't do this and all that kind of stuff and i did for a second and i said this out loud and then out loud i said to myself i was like you've got this yeah. this is okay this is a shit day and we all have shit days you'll be fine what's the easiest thing we can tick off the list today like what can we get done today so and it was like literally verbalizing that to myself made it like I made me able to then go, actually, I can get back from this. This is cool enough. You know, we're not dying. No one died. We can cope with that. And I think people think that that sounds crazy, but I am the most important person in my life. Mm. I am the only person that's ever going to be for, here for me unconditionally every single day for the rest of my life. So if I can't talk to myself positively, then who the fuck is going to do that for yeah. me? You have to be your own biggest cheerleader, I think. And if that means talking to yourself out loud in your kitchen, then so do it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I really do. And thank you for being so vulnerable and open about that. Because I think we are, you know, there's probably a lot of people listening to this that are going through a tough time, just like you, you are in your personal life. And, and sometimes just being a little bit kinder to ourselves and taking it step by step. And as you said, talking to yourself and just reminding yourself that it's okay. And, you know, you just like make make forward steps um sometimes that's all it all it takes to kind of turn and what what feels like a overwhelming and impossible situation just a little bit more bearable um and i yeah i think you're amazing and you know i i i i i'm regularly inspired by the content you produce and uh, i think everybody listening to this is gonna hopefully take on board a lot of what you've said so so Amelia, thank you so much we are sadly at our wrap-up questions um so we're going to just quickly finish up in one sentence. 
What do you think the future holds for clout? World domination. <laughs> I love the confidence. That's it. <laughs> I, 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 I know it's more than one sentence. I want, if I can rephrase that, everyone thinks of Apple when they think of a phone. Everyone thinks of Coca-Cola when they think of soda. I want people to think of clout when they think of personal branding. That is a great ambition. Um, at the end of your career, what do you want to be remembered for? Helping people. I know that sounds really fluffy and probably insincere, but it's not. Like I get my greatest joy from speaking, having these kind of conversations and, and, and talking about things and hopefully helping people and being helped through having, com you know, I just love it. I, apps, yeah, I want to be remembered as someone that bettered a couple of people's lives, I think would be yeah, great. Yeah, I have no doubt that that will be the case. Um, you're on 40 Minute Mentor. Do you have a mentor? And if you could be mentored by one person, dead or alive, who would that be and why? I don't really have a, I guess, appointed mentor, if you like, but I do have kind of informal, informal mentors who don't even realise they're mentors to me. So Harry Hugo would be one of them. He's one of the co-founders of the Go Agency. He's become a friend and he's just awesome. Like I've learned so much from him, just from like osmosis, just being with in, in his kind of vicinity. It's just helped me so much. Um, I think who I would love to be mentored by would be Gary Vee. Yeah. Um, I think it might sound super cliche and super obvious, but I don't think people realize how smart that guy is. Like they see this kind of social media whiz and just think he's, you know, all chat and stuff. But this guy has built a multi-billion dollar business off the back of his personal brand. Yeah. Um, and I think in terms of someone who, you know, I definitely admire, but also could learn so much mm. from. Um, not just from about personal branding, because, you know, we all do it different ways. I, I've got my own style. I don't really give a shit about how he does it. I care more about how he's built his mm. business off the back of it. So, yeah, I think he would be... That's a really interesting pretty cool one. person to just sit with for a, for a day. Yeah, yeah. And he, he really did sort of change the game, didn't he? Um, final question, Amelia. He basically invented yeah, this. Yeah, no, you know, he did. He did. And I, I know some people, I think when you have someone like that, that's been around for a long time, you know, some people may, may not take him as serious anymore. But you, when you look at the raw facts of the impact he's had, it's just like, there's no one really that can compete. And a lot of the things that people take as like, the norm now are just stuff that he he did in the first instance and sort of sort of blazed the trail. So uh, yeah, I have huge admiration for him. Um, final question, Amelia. What final piece of advice would you leave our listeners with? That could be career advice or life advice. But what do you want to uh, be your last message for them? My piece of advice and something that I wish I knew when I was younger was that you need to follow what your gut is telling you. Yes, you can get advice from mentors and from you know friends and family and all those things. But at the end of the day, you're the only person that's responsible for your own life and for your own choices. And if something doesn't feel right, don't do it. And it's normally when people say that you can't do something is really because they can't do it. So don't stop someone, don't stop doing what you want to do because someone told you you can't because you can. That's a powerful place to end it. Amelia, thank you so much. Very very excited to see what the rest of 2022 holds for clout um and yeah can't wait to see you in person at some point soon um, but thank you for sharing your mentorship with uh, our listeners we really appreciate it thanks so much thank you so much for having me it's been awesome